In my quest to live a long, healthy life, I've run across any number of supplements touting that very promise. Take this and you'll be healthier. Take that and you'll extend life by 30%. But here's the reality. There is one habit that improves every aspect of our lives by any number of metrics. Cancer risk, heart disease risk, life extension, physical function, and basically any other metric that you can measure. Yet only some people do it. And those that do tend to reap immense rewards from it. So what is it? And how much of an effect on the overall risk of mortality does it have? In short, the answer to the first question is muscle mass, but there's something hidden in muscle mass that needs to be accentuated because the answer isn't so simple. If you'll indulge me, I'd like for you to hear some information offered by Dr. Peter Atia on the Dr. Huberman podcast. And then I'd like to apply some context to some of the things that he mentions. Question is like, how do you improve? So what are the things that improve those? So now here we do this by comparing low to high achievers and other metrics. So if you look at low muscle mass versus high muscle mass, what is the improvement? And it's pretty significant. It's about 3x. So if you compare low muscle mass people to high muscle mass people as they age, the low muscle mass people have about a 3x hazard ratio or 200% increase in all-cause mortality. A 200% reduced risk in all causes of death if you have more muscle mass than the average person. That doesn't mean that you're going to live 200% longer. It just means that as you exist currently, you have a massively reduced risk of death compared to if you didn't have muscle mass. You are essentially holding off the reaper with immense effect, like Harry holding off Dementors with the Patronus, the Patronus being your muscle. But Dr. Atia goes on because it's not necessarily the muscle mass, but something it provides, to which I would add a bit more than what he mentions here. So let's hear him out first. Now, if you look at the data more carefully, you realize that it's probably less the muscle mass fully doing that, and it's more the high association with strength. And when you start to tease out strength, you can realize that strength could be probably three and a half X as a hazard ratio, meaning about 250% greater risk if you have low strength to high strength. So the hidden variable is strength. Naturally, if you gain more muscle, it necessitates some level of increased strength because they correlate moderately strongly, as seen in this study identifying the relationship between arm size and strength. The relationship is 0.68 which is pretty strong, but it doesn't explain everything and can differ by muscle group. Ultimately, muscle is important, but strength may be more important. So let me fill in some of the gaps here, like why is strength potentially more important? What can you do to ensure that you develop a powerful Patronus? I mean, strength. But first, let's discuss if the data actually corroborates what Dr. Atiyah says. Unfortunately, there were no links to references for me to read, so I had to do some sleuthing on my own. But it didn't take me long to find some studies that probe these questions. Additionally, this study really offered some added information that I think would be helpful for you to hear as well. So, what's the deal? Well, this analysis of over 4,500 people separated people out based on their muscle mass with a special emphasis on people with low muscle mass. Additionally, the researchers separated out people based on muscle strength, again, with an emphasis on low muscle strength. They then tracked people over time to see who died and who didn't, then compared after a set cutoff date and calculated the rate of death in each group, low muscle mass and low strength, etc. They ultimately discovered that after adjusting for weight, people with low muscle mass had a 47% increased risk of all-cause mortality, as seen here. Additionally, those with low strength had a 134% increased risk. Now, these analyses are likely a little different from what Dr. Atia mentioned, so the effect size is different. But the point is corroborated with this evidence. But the researchers took things a bit further. They wanted to know if you had low muscle mass, but you were strong relative to the average, 
is the risk still present? Or in the inverse, what if you're muscular but your strength is lower? Looking at the data, I'm showing you the low muscle mass cross-referenced against the low strength. What do we see? Well, our reference in white are people with normal muscle mass and normal muscle strength. However, if people have low muscle mass yet normal muscle strength, they do not seem to have an increased risk, which is really fascinating. Predictably, however, we can see there's an increased risk in either of the other two scenarios with greater effect sizes than if we pool all the data together, which we see with a 166% increased risk in people with the double issue, so low muscle and strength. And we see about 103% increased risk if they have low muscle strength yet have normal muscle mass. Of note, the researchers did a series of different statistical analyses and found similar results, regardless of the analysis, although the effect sizes were different. This would confirm the idea that strength is more important than muscle size specifically. Okay, but why? There are a number of reasons, but for one, people who maintain muscular strength tend to be exercising or physically fit in some capacity. Directly, however, strength also strongly <laughs> pun not intended, reduces our odds of falling and breaking our joints, which is devastating to lifespan as we get older. This analysis found an average of six years lost off of our total life if we break a hip later in life. Muscular strength is also a function of a sleek functioning muscle, devoid of junk that can be found between the muscle tissue. I'll show you what I mean in just a second. So, it can't be confounded by the junk artificially increasing the muscle size. But that doesn't mean that muscle size doesn't matter. It likely means that the quality of that muscle mass matters much more. Muscle mass, actually, I should clarify here, I'm talking about the actual cells themselves, not the mass of the tissue in total, which could be infiltrated with fat and fibrotic tissue, like what we see here. The muscle cross-section is the same size, roughly, but the one muscle is filled with fibrotic tissue, which means that there are fewer muscle cells that can actually fulfill their contractions. And this also changes their penation angle and a bunch of other issues that I can't detail right now. Clearly, a muscle with more healthy muscle cells is incredibly valuable and likely also correlates with strength at a much higher degree than a muscle infiltrated with fibrosis, which can occur with time. Anyway, muscle is the most potent metabolic sink available to our body. It sucks up blood glucose, fats, cholesterols, and everything else that you can imagine. It's greedy. And that greed helps us keep our t other tissues from oversaturation by these nutrients. Now, if you have less muscle, again, the actual functional muscle cells, not the stuffing between, you have less draw on the nutrients found in your bloodstream, which ultimately leads to significant downstream problems like insulin resistance, heart disease, and more. I'm covering about 0.0001% of the information that I could on this topic. There's immense complexity here, but it just won't fit into this one video. Still, I hope that at least you see how powerful your muscles are in keeping you safe from the Reaper. <laughs> if anyone has played the game Halo before, every time I think of the word Reaper, I think of the announcer making declarations with each successful objective. There's one where he says Grim Reaper. Actually, here it is. Grim Reaper. I annoy everyone around me by trying to emulate his voice from time to time. Uh, anyway, back to the science. Can't help myself sometimes. Okay, so we've covered some of the science, but how do you achieve this protective effect for yourself? Let's see what Dr. Atia has to say. And high strength is the ability to move loads at 80 to 90% so of defined, one repetition. It's, it's all defined by given studies. So some the most common things that are used are actually, you know, they're used for the purposes of experiments that make it easy to do. And I don't even think they're the best metrics. So they're usually using like grip strength, um, leg extensions, and like wall sits, squats, things like that. Okay. So how long can you sit in a squatted position at 90 degrees without support would be a great demonstration of quad strength, a leg extension, um, you know, how much weight can you hold for how long relative to body weight, things like that. 
So these are the kinds of tests used in studies, but they aren't necessarily great for actually achieving results. They're fine as easy measurements, but it's much easier to improve all around muscle and strength across any metric that they might use, like grip strength, by simply using compound exercises that engage a multitude of muscle groups. In lifting circles, there's often a focus on the big four, known as the bench press, the deadlift, the squat, and the overhead press. These movements engage most of the muscles in your body and create astounding results. Still, there are variations of all of these movements that can be used that lessen the burden on the body, yet lead to similar results. Eventually, however, the burden or intensity on the body needs to be high enough to stimulate change. And it's actually here that I can recommend some of my other content that dives into how to maximize muscle and strength the most efficient way possible. I hope this proved informative and good luck fighting off the 